when you stick your neck out or you do something a little bit different mm. to what everyone else is doing, that's when you're really a target mm. and that's when you need the most support. People in my close network talking about me in a way that's quite negative just because I'm giving something a crack. If I bullied them, fine. Yeah. But I'm not bullying anyone. I'm no. just out here doing my own thing, giving mm. something a crack. Seems to be coming from people who've never gone out and given something a crack. How would you get your name out there when it comes to the brand and the marketing side of things? Is in-store merchandising. Yeah. So if your product looks good in store and it's positioned in the right way and you've got the right marketing collateral around it, people will purchase it. Mm. And that's where you want people to purchase. If you're launching a business, I don't think you can launch it on the back of a trend. Yeah. I believe that you need a rich story mm. and a very rich value proposition mm. to withstand any trend. One of the things I hear all the time is around discounting things for friends. Where would you say your expectations were as a product-based business owner when it came to like your friends sharing stuff or trying stuff or buying stuff? So in terms of discounting specifically, mm. I'm going to be honest. Sophie, welcome to Top of Mind. I am really looking forward to today's chat because I know that we've had a couple of conversations offline um, about your journey so far, you know, your recent appearance on, on Food Stars. And um, I'm really excited because there's a, there's a lot of, I suppose, subject matter that we're going to cover today. So a thank lot. you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so I'm going to get straight to it. You've recently won um, Gordon Ramsay's Food Stars show. Mm -hmm. um, now, what is what does winning something like that mean to you? Yes, I did win. It's it's a very weird thing to even wrap my head around now. Winning a reality show, you mm -hmm. know, I never thought in my right mind I would ever be on a reality show. Um, I had no intent of being on one. So let alone actually being a contestant and then winning. Um, it's It's been amazing for the business. So mm -hmm. I did it for sure for brand awareness uh, mm -hmm. for the business, but then also to support my personal brand, mm -hmm. which is, you know, so important. Um, winning it has been probably the best part has been the mentorship with Janine, mm -hmm. which has just kickstarted um, last week. Mm -hmm. You know, she's someone I've looked up to for so long mm -hmm. and she can shed so much light on experiences that she's had and kind of just telling me what I don't know. And so, yeah, and obviously, you know, the money helps for scaling. Absolutely. Now, you launched your product, Soul Tonic, yeah. in 2022. Take us through a bit of that journey. I know we we're talking about kind of the different products, you know, with my e-com business and then yours around like where they were born and how they were born yeah. and the idea of, you know, where it came from. Where did the idea of Soul Tonic come from? So Soul Tonic is really just a brainchild of my love for health, wellness, fashion and beauty, mm. but deep-seated into Korean culture. Mm. So I became obsessed with K-beauty and some fashion labels that were born in Seoul that I was seeing appear in New York Fashion Week and Milan. And I became obsessed with what these Korean people are doing, especially their mm. skin treatments. You know, every second place is a plastic surgery place or Olive Young, which is their K-beauty version of Mecca. Mm. Um, so after I started looking into their way of life, I saw that there was this $400 million hangover relief beverage category. Mm -hmm. Every 7-Eleven had multiple of these products on shelf, sometimes up to 11 at a time. Um, of these anti-inflammatory tonics that people would drink for uh, liver detoxification and general well-being. Mm. And I kind of couldn't believe this didn't really exist mm. in Australia or even in the Western world as much. So I started looking into these ingredients and mm. some people would recognise today because there are there is more and more brand awareness of them. So think um, ginseng, mm. Havinia dulcis, Korea pear, Korean pear, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so then I decided I wanted to create my own and working in the beverage space for a while, mm. I knew what I wanted my brand to look like, mm. but I knew it had to be unique enough to cut through in a very crowded beverage space at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I know firsthand, like when it, when you go into a, a space that you're not familiar with, like, yes, you had a passion for, you know, Korea, you know, the culture, mm. the, you know, wellness side of Korea and the beauty side of, you know, Korean culture, but where do you start when it comes to manufacturing a product that you 
actually have no idea where to start? Yeah, it's that's such a good question because, and I this is probably my most asked question mm. as well. And th- th- this is the scariest bit about starting your own business mm. is that there actually aren't that many resources to get started, mm. surprisingly, given there's so many people who are starting businesses these days. Um, I have a lot of experience in the beverage space in Australia, absolutely zero in South Korea. Mm. So I actually went to Google, which is crazy. Mm. And I basically Googled, you know, manufacturers in South Korea. And I went into deep rabbit holes (laughs) and got scammed by a couple of sites that I thought were legit. Um, Usually I don't get scammed, but these were so real and so Mm. legitimate. I was talking to real people who Mm. were meant to be the conduit between me and finding a manufacturer in South Korea and they ended up just running right away with my money, which sucks. Yeah. But my biggest piece of advice to anyone who's looking to find a manufacturer in a foreign country is to go to the government mm. and their trade organisation that sits usually below it or is associated to it. Hey, just a quick one. If you are loving this episode, help us grow and reach more people by hitting the subscribe button and leaving a review. So I ended up landing on something called KITA, which is the Korean and International Trade Association, Mm. and they were amazing. Mm. They support local Korean businesses export, Mm. but then you can actually meet those businesses. Mm. And they gave me a translator and I just submitted my business plan and I said, this is what I need, this is what I'm looking for, Mm. and they set up all the meetings. It was great. Yeah, amazing because I feel like, I mean, you know, when I started my business, my marketing agency, it's like I have that knowledge of like, I know marketing, I know Australia, like I know clients and customers that I would go out to and I was already working with, right? But like when you go into a space that not only do you not speak the language. Oh, not even one word. I still, I'm really bad at languages. (laughs) I feel like people get languages or they don't. Yeah. And I just don't. Yeah. And when you, you know, you don't know the language, you don't know the people that you're dealing with, as you said, you know, I I say this all the time is like you only have to know 1% more than the person that you're dealing with to be considered an expert, Mm. which is terrifying. It is. Especially (laughs) when it comes to, you know, money involved, financial advice and things that can kind of really hurt somebody or a a business. How did you navigate knowing what the right next step was outside of the people that you were working with? That was really tricky. Mm. So it's a testing and learning mm. and trusting my gut. Mm. So I think um, your gut is something that we underestimate these mm. days. Everyone thinks with their head mm. and I think there is a place for that and I'm a very logical, pragmatic person mm. and I think things through. But what I've learned over the last three years of being in business is to trust my gut mm. and go with that. And if my gut is saying something's not right, it probably isn't mm. and that's I should investigate why it's not. Yeah. Was there an example that you can give me that you had that gut feeling that you're like, this isn't right and it turned out to be not right? Yeah. So particularly when I was choosing my manufacturers, Mm -hmm. um, I had, I was a really tough choice between two different individuals. Mm -hmm. One spoke no English Mm -hmm. and we were just strictly uh, working through a translator. And then the other one was actually a diplomat and he spoke amazing English And he had this incredible history. Um, He was very well connected. He understood the category. He understood my vision. But there was something about the way he spoke to me that felt off Mm. and fake. And I I couldn't put my finger on it because his credentials were so strong. And anyway, I ended up going with the Korean guy who's Mm. Mr. Park and now he's my best friend, (laughs) my current manufacturer. And then the other guy actually ended up Um, completely ripping me off, trademarking my designs in South Korea and now he's made it difficult for me to trademark my own designs because he's just stolen them. And he's he's a diplomat, like he's a lawyer. Yeah. So that proved to me the kind of individual he is Mm. and I'm so glad I didn't go into someone, I didn't go into business with someone who's capable of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's, I mean, it's one thing that I'm super grateful for some days that I'm like, I'm so glad I don't have a co-founder. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I have seen so many horror stories of people, you know, growing different ways or, you know, one person. I think, you know, you have to have a difference of opinions. I think sometimes that that's great and it creates, you know, this really healthy conversation around the way in which the business is going or the goals that you have for the business. But I've just seen them end so badly. 
it can be re- it can be really you have to be very careful with who mm. you go into business with. And so with that in mind, you have two other partners in your business or Yes, and they've got uh, the structure of the business yeah. is um, a little bit different yeah. to conventional. They, I have one um, guy who's my creative director yeah. and he was there from the very, very beginning yeah. in terms of the brand building. He was actually in Paris at the time when we built the brand mm-hmm. and so he flew over to Seoul with me um, to meet Mr Park mm-hmm. and he's been on every trip to Seoul since. So he's got a bit of skin in the game. Mm-hmm. And then I have an interesting other person mm-hmm. called Scott. Mm-hmm. He was actually my commercial director um, when he, I worked for Moet Hennessy. So mm-hmm. I was a little analyst. He was the commercial director. He was the boss, boss, boss. Mm-hmm. And in some turn of events, he's now working for Soltonic, which is mm-hmm. amazing. Isn't that so funny how, and you've probably seen this, I mean, I know your journey from, from a career point of view definitely hasn't been kind of linear in terms no. of, the, the categories or the industries that you've worked in, you've gone from consulting, um, you know, in a financial kind of very financial, very corporate role through to, you know, working at Moat Hennessy and kind of that luxury space through to Red Bull. Mm. And they're all different in their own rights. How has building relationships and kind of maintaining relationships, obviously the relationship that you have with Scott was started when you were at yeah, um, Moat Hennessy. So, how has building those relationships kind of helped you get to where you are today? It is the most important thing. I this is my biggest piece of advice for anyone mm-hmm. who's working in a corporate role in their twenties or is in a role that they might not enjoy or they're looking for something else. Is that look at your current role and look at your cohort, look at the people around you, the people that you're working for, and think that one day you can be in business with them mm-hmm. or they can help you out and just approach every day like that because Mm. trust me there will be a shift in the way you look at your work Mm. and it will be an amazing positive shift until you get to that next job Mm. that you're super passionate about um ey consulting i mean let's be real i was in (laughs) banks i was doing risk work i was doing weird technology rollouts of some niche thing Mm. in some wealth management firm look I didn't enjoy it, obviously, mm. but <laughs> obviously. Otherwise you'd still be there. <laughs> yeah. um, All right, but the connections that I built there, yeah. those people, they're going to be the CEOs of banks around me. Mm. They're going to be the CEOs of PE funds. They're mm. going to start their own things and I'm going to call on them. And I have such close relationships from that grad cohort mm. and also some of the partners and then that same approach is what I took to Moat Hennessy mm. and then at Red Bull today. And you need people around mm. you. And it's not just your close knit friends in your social circle. They're often not the people you end up leaning on. So yeah. network, network, network is just the biggest piece of advice. So I um, I was very lucky to form really close connections and it's really worked in my favour now. Yeah, absolutely. Now you touched on it briefly before around the challenges that you faced, not only with the show, but also with your product and building a business and building a brand. What are some of the challenges that you can share with us in terms and how how have you navigated them? Because I think not enough women especially, but people in general are talking about the lows of business. Mm. I think social media very much glamorises owning a business and building a brand and that's the very sexy side of it, but not enough people are talking about the challenges that they face or the times that they sit there and just bawl their eyes out because totally. I have been there. Same. And <laughs> so I chance. just think that anyone that doesn't share that or talk about that often is just not being honest. Completely. Or they haven't pushed themselves enough to be in a space that's, you know, outside of their comfort zone or difficult. Now, I live and die by a phrase that's like if it was easy, everyone would do it. One hundred percent. Gosh, and not every look. My biggest advice is not everyone should go into business. Yeah. I actually don't recommend everyone to <laughs> yeah. go into business. In fact, I would take a really long, hard think about it yeah. because there are so many low lights. But there are when the highs are high, they're so high. Yeah. But when the lows are low, they can be like treacherous. Yeah. Um, no, my, the the best way to explain the challenges is that think about everything you hate doing and then think about that potentially being 90% of your role. <laughs> yeah. So I hate supply chain. I hate ops. Yeah. I hate accounting so much. And that is the backbone of your business. <laughs> if you don't have a financially viable product mm. and you can't account for it in the right way and you don't have the right structure set up, you're not going to have a business. Mm. So your marketing can be as flashy as possible. Mm. You can have an amazing social media presence, but 
if the back end isn't in check, you don't have a business. Mm. So the challenges for me has been navigating all the accounting stuff myself before I pay. I have an accountant, but you still have to do a lot yourself, yes. which I think people don't realise. Absolutely. So accountants can only do so much for you, mm. right? And also if you don't know your numbers, then they can't really help you. Mm. Um, supply chain is big for a product-based business mm. and a lot of people who go into product-based businesses don't actually think mm. about the whole supply chain. We're talking importing, freight, warehousing, taxes, trade agreements, um, you know, packaging, you know, regulations, compliance, risk. Mm. That is huge. Mm. Um, so and then also just the day-to-day -day stresses, mm. you know, of trying to achieve so many things and then every day feeling like you've only achieved a quarter of them. Yeah. And putting a lot of pressure on yourself and being okay with the guilt mm. as well. So, look, there are so I have so many examples mm. of times like you where I've just bored my mm. eyes out thinking, <laughs> is it even worth it? But then the next day, because business changes so much mm. and every day is different, the highs are so high. Yeah. And what, given that we're in the spirit of talking about challenges, mm. What would you say kind of one of the toughest challenges that you face to date has been that you can talk about? Um, because I think, you know, one of the things that I'm really, really conscious of, you know, I regularly upload onto my TikTok being like, hey, if you're thinking about starting a business, don't. Mm, like, good, good advice. Because like there's so many people that go, I'm going to start a business because I want more work-life balance or I want to work for myself and I don't want to have a boss. And I'm like, sure, they're the kind of – nice to have that but it's not as glamorous as as you think it is so what are the challenge like what is one of the challenges that you've navigated that has kind of really made you question whether you're on the right path um that's a very good question a particular one and it might not and it might be one that people want to do is that when I first started I didn't realize that I would have to be the face of the brand. Mm. I didn't realise I would have to be the heart and soul mm. and show up every single day and showing up every single day as the face on social media but then when I, I went on a national reality TV show and all of the implications that and outcomes that have happened as a result mm. of that, that is so tiring and exhausting. Mm. You know, some days you do not feel good and mm. you have to embody your product and your brand and you have to show up for it every single day. And that has been the biggest challenge because that's a deep seated mental thing mm. that you have to conquer every day. Mm. And once you start showing up as the face, you have to be consistent. You have mm. to keep going. Hey guys, if you are listening on Spotify, don't forget to leave us a five-star rating. And if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the Q and A function on Spotify. So then you get to a point where you're in quite deep and there's no exit strategy. It's just getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So for me, that's an ongoing challenge mm. and I don't think that's ending. You know, I had a call with America this morning about um, some retail opportunity on the East Coast in some premium retailers, which is great. And his biggest thing was, so can you fly over and can you tell your story to every single one of these retailers in the next month? Is that possible? Like, can you do that? That's mm. that's what we require. And then started going through the requirements as being a founder over in America and what they expect. And I, straight away I was thinking, okay, well, how's the Australia business going to run? How am I going to fit this into my schedule? Yeah. You know, everyone requires so much of you mm. and you, there's only so much energy you can give mm. before something, it comes at a cost. Mm. So that I think is my biggest challenge. It's energy management and then showing up every day in the way that mm. I want to show up for my brand couldn't agree more. How do you manage your energy then? You're three years in, in terms of running your business. Mm. What are some kind of non-negotiables when it comes to managing your energy? So I love health and wellness. And I think everyone, in th I feel like everyone says that. <laughs> I love health and wellness. You know, I love a good time as well, yeah. but um, I've always been quite attuned to the human body. And I'm always, I love listening to podcasts on self-improvement. Mm. You know, I just spent the last month working with a neuroscientist and I do that once a year okay. and I do this brain biohack productivity thing and he coaches me through it and the lessons I've learned from that are amazing. But I have to see sunlight and ocean mm. every single day. Um, I have, I wouldn't say I have a step goal, but I have to have movement mm. in my day. Yep. And I have boundaries now. Mm. Boundaries are probably it. I can say no now. Mm. I used to just be a yes girl yeah. to everything. Everything was a yes. And now not everything is a yes. Mm. Everything's um, a yes, but 
but when, mm. you know, when do you need to know by? Mm. Yes, but can it be in X time? Mm. You know, it's not always just committing. So a lot, a lot of it is around prioritizing my time in terms of scheduling and daily movement. Yeah, absolutely. I literally had this conversation with somebody, I think it was yesterday, and they were like, my, their diary was so busy and people just kept on coming in with requests and they're like, yeah, I can do it, but in four weeks time because mm. it's not urgent. It's important, but it's not urgent. And I feel like people misunderstand the definition between the two sometimes of what is important versus what is urgent. And I'm the same as you. Like I like to, I feel like I'm a recovering people pleaser. Mm, same. I like to, um, you know, really try and help as many people as I can or meet as many people as I can or, you know, make time for as many people as I can. Um, what boundaries have you put in place then that you feel that really help with that? The is boundaries kind I've kind of having every bucket of my mm -hmm. life, right? So friends, mm -hmm. family, and then more social occasions and then work yep. occasions as well. And I only say yes to X amount mm -hmm. per week that I can manage into my schedule. Mm -hmm. And I really have to be careful around and I look ahead in the future. Mm -hmm. And then I factor in travel and pre-work and post-work. And I never used to be the kind of person that would plan every meticulous thing in mm -hmm. my calendar, but now I, I just time block. Mm -hmm pre-work time block has been the best thing ever. So if mm. I'm, for example, tonight I'm hosting a dinner with um, 40 C-suite executives mm -hmm. and they're here to talk about, uh, It's here. they want to hear from me around how do we embrace creativity within the entrepreneurial generation. Mm -hmm. So they're obviously all a lot older. They're in their yep. C-suite executive roles <laughs> and they probably they don't understand that we're in this entrepreneurial generation and everyone wants to start a business here and there. So even for tonight, mm. I've got two hours of pre-work that I just have to sit down to think about what I'm going to say. Mm. Um, otherwise, in the past, I am just chasing my tail always and I get to the end of the day and I'm exhausted and yeah. I don't feel satisfied. No. So that's probably been the biggest game changer for me. Yeah, nice. Now, you did touch on it previously around working with a neuroscientist. Yes. And I'm fascinated. Yes. Tell me a bit about that process. Things. How did it come about? How did you start doing it? You say you do it every year. Yeah. What did you learn from it? How did it start? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So his name's Dean, shout out. Shout out to um, Dean. He He's incredible. He actually reached out to me because of Soul Tonic. Mm -hmm. He, as a side project that he can't really focus on, has this red wine. It's resveratrol enhanced red wine. And resveratrol is an anti-aging supplement that a lot of people are taking now. Mm -hmm. But it's actually naturally derived in red wine. And the most bioavailable way to have it is by consuming red wine. Most mm -hmm. people have it in tablet format mm -hmm. though. So he created a wine that's got, I don't know how much, it's enhanced by resveratrol by mm -hmm. a huge amount. Mm -hmm. That one cup of it is your daily amount of resveratrol. Very amazing concept. It's yeah. incredible. It's a really nice red wine, I think from the Barossa. Um, he thought there could be some synergies in collaboration with Soltonic and how that works mm -hmm. and his resveratrol enhanced wine, both kind of better for you products, mm -hmm. playing in that kind of alcohol wellness space. Mm -hmm. um, but so when I went and met with him about this wine, mm -hmm. I was just intrigued really. Mm -hmm. And then he started telling me about the actual work he does mm -hmm. and he's big in stem cell research and um, he has this company called Simpler Health, which mm -hmm. is about supporting people having the best health outcomes, but from a science point of view. Mm -hmm. And I was telling him about all my woes. I just finished filming the TV show last mm -hmm. April and I said, I feel like I want to do a reset, but I'm not one to ever do like a juice cleanse. I don't believe in them. I don't, I just don't believe in any reset that I've ever been sold mm -hmm. on Instagram. And he goes, you know what? I'll coach you through one. It's really a brain biohack. It's for productivity um, you'll probably lose a bit of visceral fat in the short term, but it will reset your system. And the whole concept is that in the past, you've learned all these stresses and traumas and you're built up. You are who you are because of all these tiny little stresses and traumas mm -hmm. you've learned. And you, even the way we're speaking right now, mm -hmm. that's because of ways you've probably talked on other podcasts and mm -hmm. things you've learned and mannerisms you've learned. Yeah. This biohack is meant to basically reset all of that. So you have clarity and you're not driven by past stress you have okay. you're clear it's, it's I don't think I'm explaining it in the most optimal way but that's basically the gist yeah. and it's through um food and supplements mm -hmm. controlled 
over a three to five week period Mm -hmm. and then you get the most optimal results. So look, I'm not going to tell you you exactly what's in it, but I will say it's quite high protein, low carb with supplements, not exercising, which is big for me, getting your heart rate down while you're doing this and then being very strategic with the food you implement back in and then you can kind of eat normally. Wow. And what are the results that you found from doing this? First of all, I learned so much about my body. I never thought I could even do something like this. You know, I, I eat when I feel like eating. I'm not restrictive. I'm quite balanced. Um, I learned how to be diligent and really tune into my body every step of the way. I learned how to sit in hunger. I learned how, which is, I hate being hungry. (laughs) So that was a tough one to me. And I also learned um, a lot about food groups and their impact on my productivity and Mm. how eating a certain meal can directly impact the work that I'm doing straight after, which is so interesting. Mm. But the, the main thing I learned was just that you can reset you can have that mm. mental reset through food and supplements, which is crazy to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they talk about food and, you know, food, nature, et cetera, being like a, a natural um, medicine and, mm. you know, people have been using it for years. So I could totally get it and I'm fascinated. But we obviously can't talk about this the entire podcast. <laughs> now, um, you, your product, Soltonic, yeah. it's a hangover relief yep. cure. Yeah, look, you can't, say, you can't say QR. <laughs> so the ingredients. How does it work? <laughs> yeah, how, how. The ingredients, Korean pear and Hervenia dulcis, mm. which we use, have been used in South Korea for centuries, mm-hmm. um, mostly for general well-being, mm-hmm. for liver detoxification. They're both highly anti-inflammatory, very high in vitamin C, vitamin A, folate. Um, they even say Hervenia dulcis is an anti-diabetic. Um But in Korea, they also use it for um, helping digest alcohol because both of the products, both of the, sorry, ingredients, natural ingredients, have something called DHM in them, which speeds up the detoxification of alcohol in the liver. They have enzymes that basically reduce down a toxin Mm -hmm. called acetaldehyde, which is the toxin you build up when you drink. Right. So if you're going out and you're going on a bender (laughs) and you have this first, it's not going to make you feel 100% obviously because yes. you've gone on a bender and yeah. nothing will help you. Yeah. But if you're going no out, one can help no you. one can help you. <laughs> My tonic is not going to help yeah. you. I just want to put that on the record. Yeah. But if you get a hangover from, you know, six to ten wines, mm-hmm. um, having this first really helps. Mm-hmm. It really helps with those nasty headaches and stomach upset yeah. and um I sometimes people say it helps with the anxiety, but I don't know. That could be a bit placebo. But yeah, it for me, I, I won't even go out and have four wines without drinking it because in South Korea, two-thirds of the population will not drink without it. So right. why would we drink without it? Mm. Yeah, right. So you have it before you drink? Yeah, you have it before okay. you drink. Um, if you have it after, it would the kind of it would act more as um, rehydration, mm-hmm. so more as electrolytes from the Korean pear. Mm-hmm. Now, I find it fascinating because I don't drink, right? Mm. I haven't drunk for about two and a bit years Good now. On you. And I quit because my anxiety got really bad. Yeah. Um, I quit because, but it wasn't because I was having big nights and my anxiety was huge afterwards. It would happen like at like the second drink that I would have. And I just noticed I'm very, I feel like I'm very attuned with, you know, how I feel and things like that. And I just noticed that my anxiety was spiking at like the second or third drink. And I'm just like, this is not me. Like I was thinking about things that I'm just like, I don't think about this in a, you know, sober environment. So why are these thoughts coming up when I'm having a couple of drinks? Mm. Now for a non-drinker, you've obviously talked about the benefits of from a wellness point of view as Mm. well. So for a non-drinker, would you look at consuming this as a daily supplement in your kind of routine? Absolutely. So I'm feeling, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment, Mm -hmm. feeling a bit under the weather. So this morning with my Panadol, I had a Soltonic Mm -hmm. because of the vitamin C Mm -hmm. and the vitamin C there's equal amount as say consuming an orange Mm -hmm. and a half. So, you know, people lean towards oranges. People aren't as equipped for understanding the health benefits of a Korean pear. Mm -hmm. But I have many friends that will go to their local grocer Mm -hmm. and they'll have a cold Soltonic in the afternoon as a natural pick-me-up because obviously the natural sugars Mm -hmm. um, kind of act almost like an energy drink for them. Mm -hmm. And it's good for you. And then I have friends who um, 
create mocktails out of it. Okay. So they'll just add their favorite soda and mm-hmm. add, you know, like a lemon wedge or an orange wedge. Um, we've had people who use it as their smoothie bases. Okay. So they don't like the ingredients in their, you know, alternate nut milks. Mm-hmm. And they don't like using coconut water. They use the salt tonic, you know, 45 calories, all natural, adds to the flavor. Um, or I've even had people putting it in their matches okay. instead of milk. So um, Interesting. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's, it can be used for a range of things. Yeah. It, it really is. The way I see it and what's aligned to me is really that health and wellness category. Mm. It's at saunas, it's at gyms mm. ranged. So it isn't, you know, we have people who drink it before a long run mm. because that's what helps fuel them. Yeah. So no, you don't have to just be drinking. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Um, now, when you started Soul Tonic, I know firsthand I've got two businesses that are very different in terms of offering, right? And how I started talking about those two products were very similar when I launched them or service and product, right? I built my own personal brand and then off the back of my personal brand, I started talking about the products or services that I was launching as part of these two businesses, right? Mm-hmm. How did you start or where did you start when it came to getting the name of Soul Tonic out there? Because not everyone has the the luxury to go on a, um, you know, national television show to get course, it out there. Of course So, not. So where, like if someone was looking at launching a product yeah. and you're like, okay, cool, if I could go back and have my time again, yeah. how would you get your name out there when it comes to the brand and the marketing side of things? It, it's twofold. Mm. So we launched on Instagram and we just had an e-com website mm-hmm. and I didn't go on to the TV show for until five months in, but then it didn't air till a year and a half in. Yes. So I didn't actually get the benefit of going on the national TV show until about a month ago. Yes. So I was still relying on all of your traditional sources mm-hmm. of marketing. Um, product-based businesses if I'm just, I'll just talk about product-based yeah. businesses because it's a little bit different to mm-hmm. say a service-based business. With a product-based business, obviously you have to have all of the classic social pages. Mm-hmm. But the first thing I would have done if I had my time again was to start building my personal brand faster and sooner because I didn't do that. See, mm-hmm. I launched Soltonic thinking I didn't have to be the face behind the brand, mm-hmm. thinking I could just have this really cool looking product that would stand up on its own. Mm-hmm. So, but once I started going onto TikTok and being the face and really embodying the brand, that's when I started seeing some really strong Mm -hmm. results. So I would have done that faster Mm -hmm. for sure. And to give the brand more of a voice Mm -hmm. and go harder on storytelling. Mm. So a big part of Soul Tonic is the rich history in South Korea and the innovative juice extraction method and Mr. Park's third generation farming know-how and how we shoot everything in Seoul and really playing into that um, providence, Mm. which we didn't really launch with at the beginning. Mm. So, and then the other thing I would do, which is still a form of marketing, but it's not as maybe traditional in terms of social, Mm. is in-store merchandising. Yeah. So if your product looks good in-store and it's positioned in the right way and you've got the right marketing collateral around it, People will purchase it Mm. and that's where you want people to purchase. You Mm. want rate of sale in store in your retailers because then they reorder and then you have a business. Mm. So investing in point of sale Mm -hmm. that looked good was Mm. the best investment that I've ever done. And what did your point of sale look like when you invested in it? So it looked like a 12-unit stand Mm -hmm. and it had some messaging on the back Mm -hmm. and each pouch propped up into the stand Mm -hmm. and I encouraged my local grocers and little delis and favourite you know, alcohol stores to put it right at counter. Mm-hmm. So I had there were these propped up silver pouches that looked nothing like what was in store mm-hmm. and people were just purchasing it because they were interested. Mm-hmm. They were intrigued. They didn't even know what it was. They were thinking literally I'm just going to give it a go mm-hmm. and that's when we started seeing really, really good sales results and that drove a lot of the business. Thanks for listening. If you loved this conversation, don't forget to tune in to our next episode to hear part two. Don't forget to review and subscribe if you are loving this content.